know I shouldn't have favourites. It's a bit like you can't pick a favourite child, can you? But I've got to say, this is one of the finest layouts that I've seen during this year. And I've been lucky enough to see it germinating over the uh, last few years in visits down here to Poole and seeing the group of modellers that have previously brought to us, Hawfield and New Kensal Green. And Roger Sunderland, this is his project, Bournemouth West, supported by the other group members. And I've got to say, it's absolutely superb. From looking at Somerset and Dorset volumes over the years, it's held a fascination. And to see the prototype modelled in this way, I think it's absolutely brilliant. So I hope you enjoy some of the footage that we've got for you. Meanwhile, group member Chris Knight has a chat to Roger about how it all came to be. So Rod, you're a scouser, born and bred. What made you model a South Coast prototype? Well, yeah, that's true, Chris. Uh, my last uh, major layouts, both home layouts, uh, were Carsdale and Bradfield, uh, both set in the north, which is where I come from originally, so it seemed appropriate. And of course, most of my stock is from ER. Yeah. So that was really the sole reason for the change of heart? Uh, yeah, not, not entirely, though, um, having this layout uh, in this environment, you know, I got the opportunity um, to build a layout which I could never even dream of building at home. Um, 32 foot plus long is, um, is something which I couldn't do. I couldn't do it. So, yeah, this is a sort of layout of a lifetime for me. A lifetime's work indeed. Yeah. And I understand work started about five years ago? Yeah, about five years ago. Uh, myself and Dave, um, who were the principal builders, um, we, uh, Dave has a carpentry background. He kicked us off with four or five boards and we set off from there. Okay. The station obviously closed many, many years ago and many viewers may be unaware of the history of Bournemouth West and the S&D. Do you care to give us a little bit of a bit of background? <laughs> Well, um, originally, um, it, it was in fact the first station in Bournemouth. Um, uh, the, the current station, Bournemouth Central, didn't open until about 10 years later. Um, but it was both the terminus for the S&D line from Bath uh, and trains from Bristol, and also the holiday trains which came down from the North and the Midlands, uh, as well as being the terminus for some of the old LSWR services from Waterloo, Southampton, uh, Fareham, to name just but a few. So very, very busy location. Mm -hmm. Where did you get your information from? Um, a variety of sources, but we, we, we initially started by um, doing a massive amount of research and um, we amassed photographs, uh, looked through as many books as we possibly could and took personal recommendations as well on what the station was actually like because it was closed by Dr Beeching uh, the famous, Dr. Beeching. famous yeah. Dr Beeching in 1966, 65 actually so um, that was the first part about it and then we tried to convert those uh, plans for the buildings etc into actual work, working things that, work, things that we could work from sure. and build the models from sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I know Dave made the original baseboards, um, and obviously I think you laid most of the track. What, what did you use for the track? Well, the plain track on the layout is C and L, um, and, uh, but all the points uh, were built uh, sort of in situ to uh, the scale plans that we had, uh, which were actually overlaid uh, on an OS map, and we used the template system to actually make it, so, well, to get the layout to an actual scale model of the location. All the points were built using template, uh, templates uh, to the actual size that they were on the real thing. Mm. And you've got two scissor crossovers and uh, a double slip, I understand. We've got two scissors crossovers, uh, 
not easy um, and a, a double slip as well um, by the carriage washer. Um, the points uh, were all built by myself and Dave. Um, another one of our group, Steve, built uh, one of the points, which I think is actually marked. <laughs> but uh, uh, other than that, yeah, they're all built on copper clad sleepers and they all use bullhead rail. Okay. People have remarked on the detail on the station buildings. Is that your work as well? Uh, the station building's my work and the um, hotel, uh, Queen's Hotel here in the background um, and the goods shed. But other buildings such as the canopies, the superb canopies, the row of workers' cottages as well uh, and the bridge at the end as well as one of the very large houses on the back are all the work of Dave. Um, the single box, which we've only just completed, uh, is, a, is an amalgam. I, I, uh, Steve actually started the single box. The, uh, uh, I carried it on and uh, our newest member, Ralph, yeah. uh, has actually finished it off to a very high standard. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, most uh, layouts of this size, you have to make compromises uh, along the way. Where have you compromised on Bournemouth West? The only compromises on here are at the exit end of the layout where it disappears off scene. Um, there we've replaced um, where the real thing currently, uh, well, used to run onto two viaducts, one towards Bournemouth, one towards Poole, and we've replaced that with an overbridge, a road overbridge, which, although not strictly uh, correct, is actually taken from just outside Bournemouth Station, so the architecture fits in with the rest of the area. How did you decide what trains to run and in what era did you decide on and how did you come to that decision? Well, all the members of the group um, are BR uh, modellers and uh, I know that's a bit of a cliche these days because a lot of people do model this sort of era, but We've all amassed stock, which is uh, BR from various different regions, and it seems sensible to set it in that era. After all, it is the era that we remember, uh, train spotting True, days, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's it. And, and, you know, you can see a, a wide variety of stock on the layout from BR Southern Region. We even run the occasional Western Region engine, which is prototypical as they were put on Oxford on cross-country train. I know you've only done one exhibition so, so far at Swindon last year at the Steam Museum. Yeah. Uh, how did that go? I understand there was... Went really issues. well. Yeah. Uh, went really well. Um, from the uh, public's point of view, we got a lot of really good feedback. And the front of the layout ran particularly well. We had one or two issues um, within the Fiddle Yard area, um, getting trains out on time and... and uh, and that sort of thing, but it prompted us to have a rethink on the fiddle yard. And uh, we also had a loop at the time which enabled us to turn trains, but it was a very long process. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we dispensed with that, and we've now got a completely redesigned fiddle yard uh, built for us by um, Model Railway Solutions boys. And uh, that includes a, a new traverse, a 12 foot long. Yeah, it does work well. Um, you opted for DCC at the planning stage. What made you decide to go down that route? <laughs> well, Chris, <laughs> you know my views on DCC <laughs> uh, as opposed to analogue. But it, seriously, it's the only way I think we could have achieved what we are trying to do here in terms of running. Um, things like the uncoupling, automatic uncoupling, things like the sound, um, smoke, everything like that um, can only really truly be given a, uh, a good good show on, on, on DCC. I understand the rolling stock is a mixture of uh, ready to run and some kit built items as well. Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, the, the vast majority of it is, is ready to run uh, but there are several examples of kit built locos and even quite a few kit built coaches from various manufacturers um, the stock, as I said before, belongs to the members, and um, you know it, it, we're very picky about running quality. 
So every piece of rolling stock has to go through a, an A exam, which means that um, it's checked for running quality, the back-to-back -back measurements are all checked, weights are checked. Uh, it's a loco that would have run in that time period. Yeah. It sells the correct lamp codes, yeah. or disc codes in this case, and uh, it's got real coal in the group. You mentioned the advantage of DCC with uh, uncoupling, uh, automatic uncoupling of the KDs, and I know you've got a fairly novel system with the station pilot. Yeah. The amount of work that has to do. Anything else as well apart from the... Uh... Well, the coupling system is, um, is a system which I found out about, which is a, it's from a Swiss company called Pressy Models, and it basically consists of a tiny little actuator which is... Uh, attached to the KD coupling and pulls the arm but the whole thing is controlled through DCC so one press of a function button and the loco pushes forward releases the tension on the stock the coupling opens and the loco pulls away all done on one push of a button you don't have to touch it's the... very impressive yeah anything else you understand you've got a new you developed a new uh, co close coupling system for your coaching uh, yeah, all, we, we developed our own close coupling system because a lot of the coaches have to be backed over fairly complex point work within the station throat. So um, we developed this coupling, it's 3D printed, it's very simple really, it's just a bar with a uh, hole on one side and pins on the other, uh, which basically keeps the stock at an exact distance apart and means we can close a couple of coaches sure, as well. Sure. The signals have drawn comment as well, the uh, racket signals at the platform ends in particular and you made those? Yes, uh, I made the signals and uh, they're all operated by servos using uh, GF control boards which are absolutely superb, give, give you slow pull off on the signal arm and uh, prototypical bounce on the return. MSA brass parts? Uh, maybe, yeah, from mostly MSC and Alan Gibson brass parts, yeah. Operating a busy terminus with a goods yard, uh, I know from personal experience, uh, you know how much you have to keep your eye on the ball as an operator. Um, would you care to expand on the other uh, operators' positions? Yeah, the... yeah, sure. Um, basically, we need up to seven operators. Well, really, a minimum of seven, to be honest. Um, there is uh, the the key the key position in a way is the signalman. The signalman operates our control board, which is a mimic board. Um, it, you're able to set routes from anywhere on the layout into any of the platforms and uh, this also controls the signal movements as well. So the signalman will set a route for the train movement and uh, the last job he does is to pull the signal off and that means that the driver, the second position, is looking for that signal to enable him to make the train movement and he then drives the trains both in and trains. Um, yeah. yeah. Then there's a separate operator who operates the pilot um, because that's quite a busy job. Um, there's an awful lot of pilot movements. And then we have uh, somebody working the front who also talks to the public um, and operating the goods yard, shunting the goods yard. And finally, two or even three operators working the fiddle yard which is also a very busy job yes, so in order to keep things moving on the front of the layout. Yeah. What's the future for, for Bournemouth West Harwood? Our uh, next major appearance it will be at Peterborough at the BRM show sorry, on the 8th and 9th of December. Okay. Um, well, best of luck for the future, Roger, with the layout. It's certainly very impressive. Well, well thank thanks you, Chris. For your time. And thanks for your operating assistance <laughs> as well.